is Dr. Peter Victor, who's a professor in the Faculty of Environmental Studies at the University of York, uh, at York University, sorry, here in Toronto. Peter gained his undergraduate uh, education, a Bachelor of Social Sciences at the University of Birmingham in England, and completed a PhD in economics at UBC. His research interests from the start have been on the links between economies and the environment, and these days he proudly identifies himself as an environmental economist, one I should say of a relatively small group of ecologists who economists who see themselves as environmental. He identifies John Kenneth Galbraith, Kenneth Boulding, Karl Marx, John Maynard Keynes, Herman Daly, and Nicholas Jurescu Rogen as the economists who've most influenced him, and I thought that was an interesting uh, group. As well as doing fundamental academic research, Peter has uh, served in government and on many advisory panels and as a consultant in the private sector. He's the recipient of numerous awards and prizes. The one I liked best when I looked on his website was his being chosen as one of five superheroes of Toronto in 2008. I've never known someone who was a superhero before. <laughs> um, and, and he became a superhero for a very good reason. He had written a book that year uh, that is uh, quite worth reading. The other four superheroes that year were bicycles, Frank Gehry, the architect, the TTC, and free stuff. So uh, I think he was the most super of the five superheroes. Uh, Peter Victor has written five books, I think that's the right number, numerous book chapters and technical papers. And the book I'm familiar with is the one that came out in 2008, Managing Without Growth, slower by design, not disaster, and that just happens to be the title of his presentation today. Please welcome Peter Victor. Thank you very much, Peter. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, for me to be a participant in this uh, wonderful conference for the last uh, day uh, and a bit. Uh, we've heard wonderful presentations that uh, make it a little bit of a challenge when you're the last speaker, knowing that you've got a very high standard to maintain, so I will, I will do my best. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is based upon my book. Uh, I'll try to hit what I think the high points of the book are for you. Uh, but I want to put this, the whole uh, presentation in the context of storytelling. Because one of the things that intrigues me uh, uh, is the stories that we tell ourselves about the world we live in, about our society, about our economy, about our environment. And um, as an economist, one of the things that has disturbed me for many years is the sort of uh, singular story that we're all told, that is that we must have economic growth. If we don't, we face disaster. So that was what drove me to uh, investigate that question and to write the book about it and to today um, present you with uh, not just that story, but possible alternatives to it. So as da uh, Dan uh, said in the previous presentation, uh, one of the stories that is key to understand is what we mean by progress. Uh, the idea of progress in human society doesn't actually go back that far, perhaps back to the Enlightenment. But what's uh, particularly important to us today, I think, is that progress has really been defined now as economic growth. By that I mean the uh, uh, never-ending increase in the output of goods and services. And uh, it's, um, it's worth uh, investigating uh, where this idea came from because it surprises many people to discover that uh, the, the study, the commitment to economic growth is actually fairly recent. But it is thr certainly thriving right now. Uh, I just pick out one report. This comes out every year, same title, uh, the date is updated and sometimes the contents. Uh, going for growth. <laughs> this is produced by the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, and it's advice to all the member countries, the governments of those countries, as to what to do to stimulate economic growth in, in their economies. Now, why has this become so important? Well, you don't have to go back too far in history to understand this. Here's a photograph taken on Young Street in the 1930s, 
uh, during the depths of the Depression. And it turns out that Canada was hit particularly hard uh, by the Depression, uh, as measured by what happened to our rate of unemployment. And uh, this is a terrible, a terrible situation when, when an economy that is um, built around uh, the uh, growth, if you like, uh, fails to grow, and you can generate very, very high levels of unemployment very fast. And in the 30s, they didn't know how to get out of it until uh, John Maynard Keynes, one of the economists mentioned in the introduction, um, wrote this book, The General Theory of uh, Employment, uh, Interest and Money. We always call it the general theory, I sometimes forget what comes after that. In the general theory, Keynes gave us, for the first time really, a, a, a useful explanation of how capitalist economies could go for long periods of time with high levels of unemployment. The economic theory that he challenged, uh, the economic theory of the day, uh, really said that that wasn't possible because if people were unemployed, presumably they would offer to work at lower wages and therefore they would be hired back and that would solve the unemployment problem. But it wasn't happening. And, it, and he gave us the explanation of why it wasn't happening. As a result of his intellectual contributions, and the experience of World War II, in which governments, to win the war, spent enormous sums of money and really didn't worry about how they were going to pay for it, uh, what happened was we had full employment. Exactly as Keynes' theory suggested, that if governments would spend in times of recession and depression, it would raise the level of unemployment. And one result of that was that, and you can see the, the flags of various countries, that governments in those years that are listed there adopted full employment as a matter of policy. They said, we as a government will provide full employment. And they were able to do that, they thought, because they had the theoretical framework that Keynes provided and some experience to to, uh, to demonstrate that it actually worked. But it was, a, it was all about employment. It wasn't about growth. They weren't at that point committing themselves to the pursuit of economic growth. That took another 15 years. And in fact, um, for about uh, the 10 years following this, up to about the mid-1950s, mid there was virtually no discussion of economic growth as a policy objective in government, and there was nothing really in the economics literature. That's how recent this um, commitment to economic growth is. But by 1960, we have the founding of the OECD, the organization responsible for the report I spoke to you about a moment ago. And if you look at the charter of the OECD, uh, the very first item is all about economic growth. Article 1A, the aims of the OECD shall be to promote policies designed to achieve the highest sustainable economic growth and employment. And uh, in a nutshell, the reason why they were now promoting economic growth, I think there were a couple of reasons, but one reason was that they discovered that whilst you could remedy unemployment in the short term by spending lots of money, if some of that money was spent on new capital equipment, which would then expand the capacity of the economy, in the next year you'd have to spend even more money to keep all that expanded uh, out, uh, capacity employed. And so economic growth initially became a tool for securing full employment. But this was also the time of the Cold War. And there was this competition, as many of you may recall, some of you at any rate may recall, uh, between uh, the two main camps as to who could get their economy to grow faster to support a bigger military, a bigger space effort, and so on. So economic growth now had risen to the top of the economic policy agenda of, of most countries. And uh, there it stayed, and there it stays to this day. But one thing, one uh, experience quite recently, which I'm sure we all remember, uh, began to call this into question, the financial crisis of 2008. Most economists prior to the financial crisis thought that we knew the answer to the question of how to sustain economic growth. And, and we needed to do that not just for employment purposes, but for tax uh, revenue purposes, and so on. They weren't watching the balance sheets. Now that's a true statement, uh, it's been well documented. Most economists, in fact, I would include myself in this, we weren't trained to read balance sheets. And so the, what was happening to the balance sheets of corporations and to a much lesser extent to government was not being tracked. And um, so they didn't see the financial crisis coming. Um, if we try to now explain that crisis, 
Uh, it can be done in many different ways, nicely summarized in this particular graphic. <laughs> it's not mine. But what it does, it just, if you just read along the top, there was uh, people saying monetary policy was too easy. In other words, governments and central banks were making too much money available. Um, there was under, an underestimation of risk in the financial markets. The banks didn't know what they had invested in. The whole idea of securitized loans and so on. Um, failures of corporate governance. The, the, the boards of directors were not watching what their managers were doing. Households were saving too little and borrowing too much. The federal governments were, were running budget deficits and so on and so on. And it's, it, I think what this says, by the way, is that there is no single uh, explanation of the financial crisis. There are multiple explanations. But one thing that struck me that's missing from this, which I think is, uh, is very much related to the financial crisis and to other problems, is greed. Uh, it informed a lot of those activities that were put there on the previous, uh, previous diagram. And um, this greed is, is uh, pervasive and it's leading to uh, an also, uh, a wide variety of problems, including uh, a, an increasing inequality in income and wealth, which has now finally come back, coming back on the, on the economic and political agenda. Um, it used to be there, uh, the economists started you know, there 200 years ago, very concerned about distribution, but that got put aside for other issues, and now I think it's coming back. And if you look at the data, by the way, this was put together by the Conference Board of Canada, which is not normally an organization that I would readily identify with, but they, they point out that 71% of the world's population are living in countries which have experienced an increase in the inequality of income distribution. <laughs> So, this is a huge problem, but you see, this might be as far as uh, a standard economist might go, and, and there's lots more to be said about this. Because I'm an ecological economist, um, uh, I bring the environmental dimension into this. We don't just have greed in the sense of wanting too much money. As other speakers have said before me, we as a species are very greedy in terms of what we are expecting to obtain from the planet to support our, our way of life. So let me provide you with a little bit of historical data on this uh, consumption of resources. This is a graph that runs from 1900 to 2005. And it's a, a, a graph of the total materials used by all the economies of the world. Now, when we use, when we use the term materials in this context, that includes fossil fuels because they are brought into the economy because we want energy from them, but they are brought in as materials. So let's see what happened in the first half of the 20th century. And you can see a slow but steady increase in the global extraction of materials. There are four categories. The green is biomass. The blue is fossil, what do they call it? Fossil energy carriers, fossil fuels. The light blue is ores and industrial minerals, and the gray is construction materials. So, as I say, a slow and steady increase that took us to the middle of the 20th, 20th century. Now look what happens in the next part of the 20th century and just into the 21st century. This, this massive, massive expansion of the extraction of resources required to run the economies around the world. Of course, not all economies draw on these resources equally. This is uh, the wide dispersion in the extent to which different countries and different economies and people within those economies extract materials. But this gives us the global picture. Now, one thing we know from the uh, law of first law of conservation is that, uh, I should say first law of thermodynamics, is that um, all the materials that's brought into the economy gets used and then disposed of. It, it, it doesn't stay in the economy. Most materials, in fact, are, are in and out of the economy within less than a year. And so, uh, it's no surprise, therefore, that if we're bringing in all of this increased amount of materials, that we run into the kind of problems that Dan has already highlighted when he showed the same picture that I'm showing. Um, but I do think it's important to understand this relationship between what we take from the, uh, from, uh, the biosphere in terms of resources to run our economy and the impact that that has on the biosphere, because those materials are taken, used, and then disposed of in various ways. And in many respects, we've uh, exceeded the capacity of the biosphere to absorb our wastes. I want to focus just for a few moments on energy. 
because one of the distinguishing features of our era is the extent to which we have energy available to us to undertake all of the production and consumption that we do. The very best book on that question, in my view, is written by Robert Ayers, uh, and it's called The Economic Growth Engine, where he argues that, that, that it's the increasing access to energy, to cheap energy in particular, that has made our kind of life and our kind of economic growth possible. Now, in the book, he makes a very cautious prediction. He says, although highly uncertain, the most probable forecast for US gross domestic product is one in which growth ceases sometime between 2030 and 2040. So I thought it might be useful to look at the historical record and see well, what's been happening to the US growth rate. Um, are we seeing any indication that it's in decline? So I put together this chart. It goes from 1961 to 2011, and each successive dot just shows you the uh, annual rate of growth in, in that year for the US. And you can see the downward trend, uh, it's very clear. Um, and if you run that forward, and I'm not saying that is what's going to happen, but it's, if the trend was to continue, you can see that not long in the future uh, we would be where Ayers is saying. Now that's total economic output. But if you look at economic output per person, which is a much more useful measure, I think, um, that's what you see. So if current trends continue, uh, economic growth may well come to an end in the United States in 20 or 30 years' time. What about Canada? It's a very similar picture. Not surprising because our two economies are very connected to one another. Rate of growth is on a downward trend. If we look at the per capita rate of growth, same thing. There's a lot of concern in um, official circles about the slowing rate of growth of the economy. Um, uh, there's a tendency to think that we've, we've slowed down and now we're at sort of 2%. Can we manage with that? Uh, but the downward trend would suggest that uh, it, it may just keep slowing. Now I want to go back to John Maynard Keynes again, because he talked not just about how to fix unemployment in the Depression, he also, uh, in a very interesting essay that I recommend to you all called The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, cast his mind forward uh, about a hundred years or so and said what he thought might be possible. And he said the following, that the economic problem, by which he meant a problem of shortage, that we just don't have enough, may be solved, or be at least in sight of solution within a hundred years. So again, I, I like to sort of look around and see, is, is there any evidence that this is happening? Are we, are we on the brink of solving the economic problem in the sense, are we experiencing in any way uh, a glut of output? Well, here's an uh, interesting story. Um, if you look at the data, it says that between 1950 and 2011 in the US, where the data is easier to get than for Canada, but I expect it's similar here, occupants per house decreased 23%. Living space per person increased 229%. Home size increased by 152%. So, on average, we've all got more space. But, obviously not enough to store all the stuff we've got. <laughs> These are uh, sprouting up everywhere. What is going on? So, this to me is an indication that, again, I'm talking in averages, one would need to, to tease that apart because different groups are affected very differently, to show that um, the economic problem is in sight of solution. Uh, a further indication that that's the case, you can see what's happening here. This is a group of um, presumably company uh, higher-ups uh, cutting a ribbon, maybe there's some politicians here, to celebrate the opening of a new factory. Now, it used to be thought that if you had a new factory, it would produce things that you needed, and we would celebrate that fact. Uh, and the whole thing's been turned upside down now. What we celebrate is factories create jobs. Not that the factory is producing something we need, but it creates jobs. Here's another one. A steel plant. It's going to create new jobs. No, no mention of we need the steel. Um, <laughs> Nissan, to create jobs. I thought they made cars. No, they make jobs. <laughs> um, another one. In fact, I, I, I look at the, at the press all the time to see if anybody's going to carry a headline which says, a new factory which produces something we really need. So, hard to find. So again, it's an indication that maybe Keynes was right. That we don't, we, 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 we know how to produce. We don't know how to distribute. I'll come back to that in a little while. 
Finally, I want to uh, refer to another graph. It's very similar to the to one that Dan showed. I'm glad it's not the same, because when you're sitting there watching the speaker before you, you're worried that they're going to show you the things you're about to show. But this is a graph which goes from 1945 to 2005. It shows on the right-hand side, um, the scale is a real gross domestic product per person in the United States, in other words, inflation adjusted. And on this side, it's the response to a survey that's done every year where Americans are asked how happy they are. So if you look at the data for the first, whatever, 25 years up until um, about 1970, although the lines don't move together, they also don't fly apart in a conspicuous way. But then look what happens after that. If anything, the percentage who, of Americans saying they're very happy has gone down. Meanwhile, economic output has gone up. I think this can all be um, encapsulated by looking at the following ad. This is what we're promised. This is what we get. <laughs> so we need different stories. This story is no good. This story is not right for us. So what are the uh, uh, alternative stories that are out there? Well, one that we've been hearing quite a lot about in the recent past is green growth. In other words, we'll still keep growing, but if we can find a way to green it, in other words, I suppose, reduce the burden that our expanding economy is placed on the biosphere, then we can somehow have the best of both worlds. We'll have more economic growth and we'll have a better environment. Um, in this report from UNEP that was produced for the conference in Rio in 2012, their very first key message was that a green economy grows faster than a brown economy over time with, uh, while maintaining and restoring natural capital. Again, not nature, as was said before, but natural capital. But isn't it striking that the very first thing they want to say is that a green economy will grow faster? So this is not a critique of growth. This is as much a uh, desire to pursue growth as, 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 as anything we've seen before, but it's just saying that if we green the economy, well, that'll, that'll help us grow even faster. So let's look into this a little bit, shall we? What do we mean by expanding the economy and reducing the impact on the environment. So this is not data, this is just a representation of what I think those ideas are trying to tell us. So this shows GDP rising into the future steadily. So that's growth. Then it says, then I think what Green Growth says is that we can decouple the use of resources from economic growth. So in other words, we can produce more value because actually GDP ultimately is a measure of value, which makes the debate about growth and limits to growth a little more complicated than it might seem. But it says here we can increase the output of valuable goods and services as we reduce the inflow of services. That's one element of, of, of uh, green growth. The second is, in addition to reducing the quantity of resources we use, we'll take further steps to reduce the environmental impact. So this is what green growth is supposed to be about. Well, what have we experienced in the past? Can we learn anything from that? So this is now real data from 71 up to 2010 from the World Bank. I use world GDP. Oh, no, this is high income countries. Sorry, high income countries. That's all the rich countries. Uh, their GDP for, um, well, let me see what I did put on here. Energy with my measure of resources. And carbon dioxide is the measure of environmental impact. And you can see that for the last uh, 40 years, GDP growth has been quite steady. Energy use hasn't gone up as fast as GDP. And a lot of people look along that, uh, upon that and say, this is fantastic. We've got decoupling. Well, of course, it's, if you like, relative decoupling. But it's not bringing the energy use down below the 100 mark. So it's not doing what we need from green growth. And the same with greenhouse gases. Now, that's for high-income countries. Now, I'm going to show the same graph or similar graph for low-income countries, but I want you to see that the, the um, scale has changed. Well, now it goes up to 800. Well, let's see what's happened in the rest of the countries of the world. So, virtually no decoupling on, on carbon dioxide and a little bit on energy, but as I say, only relative decoupling. This is not good. Um, a very recent study uh, produced a very nice result, which I want to share with you. Again, um, looking at real data from 1990 now to 2010 for all the countries in the OECD, the rich countries, and it has three variables on the graph which I'll display in a moment. GDP, the, the measure of, of growth, 
Then it has this red line, which is domestic materials consumption, where they ask, well, how much material do the OECD countries take from their own area to fuel economic growth? And then they look at what they call the materials footprint. They say, well, if you look at all of the materials that the OECD countries extract, not just internally, but from abroad, what does the story look like? Has there been any decoupling? And here's, this, here's what it is. So you can see the red line, the domestic consumption of materials by the OECD countries, rose more slowly than GDP, the blue line. Again, relative decoupling. But when you look at the resources that the OECD countries import from the rest of the world, there's been no decoupling. So, this doesn't mean that green growth is ruled out in the future, but it does suggest to me, at any rate, that we haven't seen any of it in the past. And so why would we want to pin all our hopes on that in the future? Um, what comes next? Well, I'm just going to try and uh, cover this topic, which may be a little difficult for some who aren't very happy looking at, at graphs all the time. But uh, there are no equations in my talk, so I thought I'm doing something good here. <laughs> but I, I, rather, I, I got very interested in this question of the scale of an economy and its efficiency. Because those two things play into one another. If you increase the scale of an economy, but we make it more efficient, you can see these move in opposite directions. As long as we become more efficient, faster than the economy grows, then that should mean an overall improvement. And that's what I'm going to illustrate with this, with this particular graph. On the upright axis, we have GDP for Canada. And on the horizontal axis, we have the reverse of efficiency. We call it intensity. So this is greenhouse gases emitted per dollar or million dollars per, uh, of GDP. Let me put some lines on here. In 1990, the base year for Kyoto, that was Canada's GDP, about $900 billion in 2002 dollars. The greenhouse gases we emitted in Canada for every million tons of GDP is shown by that line. And so if you multiply that intensity by the size of the economy, you get the 591 megatons of greenhouse gases Canada emitted in 1990. Now we could have emitted the same quantity of greenhouse gases with a larger economy and a lower intensity or a smaller economy and a higher intensity. So it's easy to show all those combinations. Anywhere on that red, right, red line shows a combination of the size of an economy, measured up this axis, and the intensity, GHG intensity, along this axis. So we can grow as long as we get a greener. Well, I use this to define green growth. To me, green growth means you start out at that point where the lines cross, and you move into this green triangle. Because anywhere in that green triangle, the combination of the scale of the economy and the intensity results in a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared with the starting point. But if you're on the other side, then that results in an increase. Well, what happened between 1990 and 2010? Well, every point I'm going to put on the graph now shows you the results for every successive year. Oh, sorry, I'm going to fit out the rest of the graph ahead of myself. Here's brown growth. So this would be a growing economy where the intensity declines, but not fast enough to keep up with the, the growth of the economy. So overall emissions rise. And then we have black growth because intensity has actually increased in that scenario. And then we have degrowth, a smaller economy, which could result even then in larger emissions if intensity went up fast enough. So now I'm going to use this apparatus to say what has happened in the past. So here's... <coughs> Um, same graph, lines of scale has been changed a little bit, but the data is exactly the same. Shows where we were starting, so every point is going to show what happened between 1990 and 2011. <coughs> it's not a happy picture, especially since we're supposed to have been trying to do something about this problem. So here we are, more or less in the present day, because the data is always a little bit behind the times. Um, 702 megatons uh, of greenhouse gases going out as opposed to 591. What happens if we play this forward? Use this apparatus to say, well, what might be possible in the future? So we're going to start from 702 megatons and say, what might be possible in the future? Could we get green growth? So I've drawn a red line, just like before, except now it's at the 702 megaton limit. And I've said, I'm going to set an ambitious target, 
of an 87% reduction in greenhouse gases over 50 years. Which means that we want to get anywhere we can, somewhere, on that purple line. Well, if we do it by green growth, we, we, it says we've got to say somewhere in that triangle. If we do it with no growth, it means we're just going to scoot along this bottom axis, like this. So the economy doesn't get any bigger, but the intensity gets smaller. See how small it has to get? That's with no economic growth. We've got to go from uh, over half a kiloton of greenhouse gases emitted per million dollars of output to 0 0.067. That's only 13% of where we are now. That's an enormous reduction in intensity. We've never seen anything like it. Is it likely to happen? Well, we can speculate on that. It would mean that year over year, we would have to reduce our greenhouse gas intensity by 4% year after year after year. That's with no economic growth. But now what happens if the economy grows? Say it grows at 2%. Well, now we're going to be looking at a much bigger economy 50 years from now. The intensity has got to get down to 0.025, which is only 5% of what it is today. That's a complete transformation of our economy and its energy. And if we grow at 3%, which is closer to the historical rate, we've essentially got to get every unit of greenhouse gas out of the, our production system. Well, um, it mustn't make me very optimistic to think we're going to do that. And what it says to me is that we really do need to focus on the rate of growth we want, because it has implications for the extent that we're going to rely on technological change and lifestyle changes to, uh, to solve this particular problem, one among many, of course. So we turn to technology. What can we say about technology? Um, well, what do I say up there? Helpful but not sufficient. Why do I say that? Well, look at the history a little bit. This is what a computer looked like, like, looked like the year I was born. Um, it was a pretty dismal world, wasn't it? All black and white and a bunch of men in suits running a huge room of machinery to do simple calculations, but nonetheless got us started. By the year I was finishing my PhD, uh, worlds in colour, much more efficient machine, we could do much more with it. This 1997 is the year that students coming into our university in September were born. It's sobering that. I don't have a lot of history, do they? That's what a computer looked like in the year they were born, and this is what it looks like now. Now let's look at telephones. There's a telephone from 1946. Now here's one in 1970. It didn't change very much. It was in color. But one of the things that's intriguing, because you can sometimes see examples of where technology goes backwards. Some of you will remember we used to have that little tray underneath the telephone built into it where we would keep the numbers, telephone numbers. And by 1970, you didn't get that, and you got a phone. And a real setback. <laughs> By 1997, cordless phones, and yeah, it doesn't even look like a phone, but that's what it is. Now this is fantastic change in technology, and it's all about miniaturization that's made this possible. And there's a sense that miniaturization lightens our pressure on the biosphere, but unfortunately it's not as simple as that. Miniaturization has also made this sort of thing possible. You couldn't design it, you couldn't build it, you couldn't operate it without computers. So you can't have this kind of massive scale technology without miniaturization. And of course, it's this that clearly does damage to the biosphere. Look at that, the world's largest earth digging machine. Those are people down at the bottom there. Again, it's miniaturization that makes this massive scale uh, possible. Here's a pretty standard cityscape, and then they added that. Uh, again, it's miniaturization that makes this, if you like, maximization possible. But this is my favorite one, because this is the world's largest cruise ship. Uh, is that cru cruise ship? Um, and here's what the project engineer says about it. I would say this is the most environmentally friendly cruise ship to date. It is much more efficient than other similar ships. And what they're saying is on a per-passenger basis, if it's full, uh, the energy use presumably would be lower than a smaller ship. But when this docks at a Caribbean island, as they typically do, you can imagine when tens of, well, not ten, but 5,000, 6,000 passengers get off, plus the crew, it's not very environmentally friendly. And what I'm showing you here, miniaturization leading to very large-scale technology, is an example of Jevons's rebound effect. Jevons was an economist who wrote in the mid-19th century, and he wrote a, a remarkable book called The Coal Question, and in it, he looked at the question of, well, what happens when uh, steam engines become more efficient? Does Britain use less coal or more? And he said, it's wholly a confusion of ideas to suppose that the economical use of fuel is equivalent to a diminished consumption. 
It, the very contrary is the truth. And the reason for that in economic terms is that when you make something more efficient, you make it cheaper. If you have a more efficient car, it's cheaper to run. If a car is cheaper to run, people will generally drive more. It's as simple as that. Or if it's cheaper to build, uh, to um, design and, and build those huge pieces of equipment, then they will go ahead and do it. So the rebound effect is a real problem for us in working our way out of the dilemmas we face. So I don't like the green growth story. I'm not giving up on alternative stories. Got a, yet a third story. If you've ever studied economics or opened an economics textbook, you would have seen something like this. This is the fundamental perspective of economists of what an economy is, in its simplest bare bones terms. Firms sell goods and services to households. Households supply, they're the ultimate owners of the land, labor, and capital, which they provide to the firms, and money goes in the opposite direction. So I make it move because it looks nice. Um, and this is what most economists <laughs> study, and there's, a, there's tremendously interesting work that's been done on this. And I just want to highlight one thing. When we talk about economic growth, I've already mentioned it once and I'm going to say it again, what economists are measuring are the money flows there, not the material flows. And so when we talk about whether there are material limits to growth, it's not a simple one-to-one -one relationship. You have to investigate that relationship to see what it is. I find this perspective on the economy hopeless for understanding the environmental implications of the economy because there's no environment. I and mean, if that's your worldview, you're never going to see that there are environmental issues related to the way the economy functions and grows. So let's add in some of the things that are missing. We have here at the bottom representations of materials provided to the economic system, as I showed you the data before. Can't run an economy without a continual inflow of materials uh, from, the, from the biosphere. And as I said before, when we use the materials, we dispose of them back into the biosphere, overloading very often the capacity there of the sinks to absorb the wastes. That disrupts a whole range of biophysical cycles, which comes back to bite us down here on the supply, not just of the materials, but of the services that Elena was talking about. And all this takes place on planet Earth. So all we've got coming in and out of planet Earth is, is, is heat. The rest is, we've got the economy, best understood as a subsystem of the biosphere. And we need to do a better job of measuring and tracking these material flows, which uh, economists like myself do try to do. Well, I'm, it's when you, when you see the economy in this way, you can't help wondering about economic growth. Even though you understand it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between growth measured in, in dollars and, and growth measured in materials. Um, and I'm glad to say that many people are now questioning growth. I, for a while I was collecting news clippings that suggested that. There's the Montreal Gazette on the sustainable economy, the Global Mail, uh, can you do well without having more, uh, the spectrum of a no-growth world, new limits to growth, revive, well, fusing. It just goes on and on. Paul Krugman, even, running out of planet to exploit. Isn't that a remarkable headline? Um, new scientist, the folly of growth, goes on and on, I won't bore you with them all, but there are lots of them. There's, there's Spiegel, here's The Economist, which a couple of years ago ran a whole issue on progress and its perils. There are many books being written, I'm just gonna mention one. <laughs> <laughs> Prosperity Without Growth, a report to the UK government on this very question. Uh, growth is impossible from the New Economics Foundation in Britain. Uh, the Center for the Advancement of a Steady State Economy, which has a petition, by the way, which you can sign online if you wish to uh, sign with those who are questioning growth. Uh, there are conferences now on degrowth, the New Internationalist, I mean, it doesn't. Degrowth in the Americas, a conference in Montreal a couple of years ago, and here's a book called Enough is Enough. And it's not just um, media, it's not just academics, it's also possibly becoming a social movement. Uh, we saw the Occupy movement, uh, but this is, uh, I took this one because the headline on the, that I didn't invent was European activists against economic growth. So what I decided to do in my book, along with sort of telling these stories in, 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 in the book in a more amplified way, was to see what I could do by computer modeling, to see what alternatives might be possible. So I developed a model of the Canadian economy, which I called Logro. And I set it up to address one particular question. Can we have full employment, no poverty, fiscal balance, which means the government doesn't run a deficit, 
reduce greenhouse gas emissions without relying on economic growth. Because the mainstream thinking is the answer that is no, you have to have growth for everything else. So I wanted to see whether, based upon some plausible assumptions, rather conventional economic theory and use of data, uh, I could see whether there was a different outcome. So, oh, this is the answer. <laughs> um, so what makes an economy grow? Well, we can look at it from the demand side. What is it people want to buy uh, in an economy? What do they spend money on? Well, we spend money on consumption. That's part of GDP. It's the biggest part of GDP. When businesses spend new, mon new money or, or spend money on new equipment, uh, that's part of uh, GDP. When government buys goods and services, that's part of GDP. And if we sell more to others than we buy from abroad, that increases our GDP. So we can look at this from the demand side. We can also look at it from what is our capability to produce like. That depends upon our labor force, its size, its skills, and whether it's employed, on our capital stock, the equipment, all the infrastructure that we have, and all of the factors that go into productivity, which uh, uh, can include things like improved software, better organization, as well as uh, uh, more equipment. So all of those are represented in the model. I'm not going to go into detail about how I did that. But what I want to show you is some of the scenarios that come out of it. So the first scenario, starting from 2005 to 2035, is what we might call a business as usual case. In other words, if the trends of the past in Canada were to continue into the future for 30 years, how would the economy perform? Now this model doesn't deal with month to month and quarter to quarter changes, it, it, it's a long term model, it, it's all in annual data, so the curves look a lot smoother than they would be in reality. Now the black line there shows my projection of GDP per capita. Steady rise, steady economic growth. The green line shows what happens to greenhouse gas emissions if historical trends continue into the future. Doesn't go up as fast as GDP per capita, but they go up nonetheless. The blue line is the unemployment rate. Goes up, comes down again, so that's nothing, no interesting story there. The red line is quite interesting. This is the government's debt to GDP ratio. It comes down steadily. When I did this work in 2005, we were running a surplus, uh, if you looked at all governments across the country, and if that trend, which was part of a trend, continued, that's what would happen. But the sad part of this for me, apart from the greenhouse gas emissions, is the brown line. That's the UN's Human Poverty Index. It's a measure of poverty based upon lack of income, uh, lack of literacy, and a short life expectancy. And what it says is that if historical trends continue in Canada for 30 years, there'll be more poor Canadians in 2035 than in 2005, even with all that economic growth. So, this isn't a happy story, but it's, it's I have to say, broadly speaking, what um, mainstream economists and, and most politicians uh, are striving for, even if they don't realize it. So then I said, well, what would happen if I s removed all of the pressures for growth in the economy, all the growth drivers, all of these things I mentioned before, so let's stop consumption growing, investment growing, government expenditure growing, and so on, starting in 2010 and phasing that down so they're not growing anymore by 2020. And I did expect it to be disastrous, and I wasn't disappointed. <laughs> Um, if you just take a an economy that's trying to grow, that needs growth, and you stop it growing, unemployment goes through the roof. We learned that from Keynes. It's, in some ways, as a modeler, it's comforting to me to see the model produces that result. If it didn't, I'd be very worried. Poverty goes up. The government debt-to-GDP ratio gets completely unmanageable. Now, you see on the far right-hand side, GDP per capita has leveled off. We've got no growth. And greenhouse gas emissions have come down. But this is a disaster. This is frightening. And this is not what we want. This is by disaster. So can we do better? Well, as I said, lots of people are asking these kinds of questions now. This is Larry Elliott, the economics uh, editor from The Guardian. And he wrote, this is in the midst of the financial crisis. The real issue is whether it is possible to challenge the growth at any cost model and come up with an alternative that is environmentally benign, economically robust, and politically feasible? That's a very good question, and I only have a glimmer or a part of the answer. And the answer comes in generating a scenario which does look more attractive in many respects, economically and environmentally, and then if that's plausible, then perhaps it has some political legs. So 
In this scenario, I also make changes from 2010 to 2020. The economy finally stops growing, and you'll see it is a prettier picture than before. So you can see GDP per capita has leveled off. Greenhouse gas emissions have come down significantly. The unemployment rate is lower than it's been for 50 years in this country. The human poverty index is way down, we the lowest in the world, and still the debt to GDP ratio is very, very manageable. So how do you, how do you make that happen? Well, I'm gonna put a list of things up here. I'll, I don't have time to explain them in, in any detail, but if there's time for questions, I can expand on them then. Some of these things I'm gonna put up are actually in the model, and others complement the model. Um, the first is, we do need to think about success in very different ways. If we define success in terms of economic growth, well, we're in the growth trap. So we need new meanings and measures of success at all levels, global, national, community, and, and personal. Fewer status goods. One of the things that drives consumption is well known. There's this desire for status to prove your relative position is higher than somebody else's. Meanwhile, they're trying to do the same thing. Of course, it's a zero-sum game, and everyone ends up being dissatisfied except the very few at the top, perhaps. I do think we need limits on the materials and energy that we extract from the biosphere, and we need to limit the waste we create, and we need to limit the transformation of land use. Uh, we can't rely on efficiency to get the job done because of the rebound effect. And I'm glad to say there are many examples, piecemeal examples, of where we are doing, uh, imposing some of these limits. In this scenario, the Canadian population ultimately is stabilized by the end of uh, uh, 2035, as is the labor force. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions come down in this uh, scenario, not just because the economy isn't growing at the end, but because there's a carbon tax, quite a hefty carbon tax in place, providing all those who produce greenhouse gases with an incentive to do better. And the th one thing I would just want to say about a carbon price um, in uh, in, in, as I understand it to work, is that it makes all prices better. It doesn't, doesn't just improve the price on fossil fuels, but the price of fossil fuels, for example, influences all other prices. So it, has a, it permeates through the economic system when you have a, a carbon price. We definitely need a more efficient capital stock. In other words, our capital equipment should use less energy, should use less uh, materials uh, when, they, when it's operated. Unemployment comes down in this scenario because I model a shorter work year. We used to have a decline in the work year in Canada steadily until about the mid-70s, and after that, the average work year more or less stabilized. All I do in this scenario is I resume that historical trend out to 2035. The poverty index comes down because I model more, more generous anti-poverty programs. Trickle down doesn't work, but we know that uh, through effective anti-poverty programs, we can make a big dent on poverty, and so that's, that's model and costed in the model. There's no free money here, so it all goes into the calculation of the government's debt to GDP ratio, or the, the government's debt. And education, um, I, the trends I see is we seem to be so fixated on, on, on educating students for employment uh, rather than for life in general, and I think that's a sad trend that needs to be reversed. Now, is this really uh, a way out there, or, or is there any chance this will be picked up by the mainstream? Well, there's nobody more mainstream when it comes to economic growth than Robert Solow. He got the, well, it's the sort of Nobel Prize in economics um, for his work on economic growth. And anybody who works in the area uh, always refers back to his work. Well, here's what he was quoted as saying in Harper's in 2008. It's possible that the US and Europe, I guess we can include Canada, will find that Either continued growth will be too destructive to the environment, and they are too dependent on scarce natural resources, or that they would rather use increasing productivity in the form of leisure. It's exactly the scenario that I put up. And here's Robert Solo. Nobody has greater stature in the economics profession when it comes to economic growth than this economist. And by the way, when I read the quote, I could hardly believe what I was reading. I wrote to him to confirm that he'd been quoted properly. <laughs> and he wrote back and said, yeah, that's good. But, thou the but, can we adapt to such a transformation in the way an economy would operate if it wasn't growing? I don't have any doubt that individuals can adapt. We're a very adaptable species. That's not the problem. The problem is our institutions. It's hard to think of any institution that isn't predicated on growth. So here's a picture of a university, government, 
we've got liberal institutions adapt, we've got production, we've got consumption over there, we've got a religious institution, global institution, uh, the bank, uh, central bank over there. These are all built around growth. And I think it's a key question as to whether these institutions uh, will take us into a better future because they can show that they can adapt better than I think or whether they'll hold us back. And that uh, makes me a little bit uh, concerned uh, because I lean to the latter. If we don't adapt, I'm afraid it's a very gloomy future. Uh, this is my gloomy picture. we are heading off into a horrible thundercloud. But I don't think that is the only future. I do believe that myself and now, uh, glad to say, other economists are mapping out uh, different possibilities for us. There are alternatives. The TINA principle doesn't work. There are alternatives. But we have to understand them better, and we have to discuss them more, and then we have to choose them. And if we can do that, then I think there's a much brighter future out there, which is the image I want to leave you with. Thank you very much. Nice talk, Peter. How do you think we're going to get to that stable population and stable workforce when we've got this uh, baby boom now retiring, going through the, the process? Um, we're immediately into a very sensitive issue, and that is that um, population growth in Canada, my analysis there was particularly for Canada, uh, is all dependent on immigration policy. And so what I did in the, uh, in the, in the modeling was to uh, look at the poly uh, population projections that Statistics Canada produces and then calculate how many uh, immigrants in the different classes of immigrants that we have, uh, you know, refugees, humanitarian cases, but the bulk are what we call economic immigrants. How many economic immigrants, if any, Canada would need to have a stable population? And the striking thing is that if we end up tracking along the low, the lower um, population projection that StatsCan produces, we would still need just over 100,000 economic immigrants to stabilize the population in Canada. This is troubling in two respects. One is that as a country, we tend to get the bulk of our immigrants these days from poor countries. I mean, so we go for, for qualified people, trained people, and wealthy people who bring them over. And that's not something that the countries they come from particularly applaud. So it's a very complicated issue, but it is manageable. If we want a stable population in Canada, it's a matter of, uh, of, of immigration policy. And if I might have a, a second go, we enjoy a, a pretty good standard of living here, but there are other parts of the world that are trying to attain what we have. So on a global scale, probably we need to uh, do more than no growth here to accommodate the growth that the others would have to achieve to come to our standard of living. I do think we're going to do that. Um, first of all, let me say as clear as I can that the the growth that we need to stop and reverse is the growth in the use of materials and energy and the transformation of land. That's, that's what is having the demonstrably bad effect on the environment. Then that poses the question of what can we attain, what can we achieve in our economy under those kinds of uh, re reductions? Um, some of my economic colleagues would argue that, well, we can still have some growth if we're smart enough about it. And I, I, you know, to me, I'm, I'm, I don't care too much about that because if we're controlling the things that really matter, then whatever the economy and the ingenuity of people uh, can achieve, uh, well, let, let, let's go for it. That's why I, I'm in favor of uh, policy administered limits on, on materials and energy use. Because I think if we can get that right, then we don't have to worry too much about what happens to, to GDP. There's an economist out there who talks about A growth. He says, let's just not even think about GDP. It's not a relevant measure. Now, you ask about other countries. The reason why I think this is a good approach to take is that um, if poorer countries are to uh, improve their material standard of living, they are going to have to have more room on the planet in some sense uh, 
uh, which we can only help them with if we have if we take up less of the space. So that's what we have to do. That's the part that we have to play. I, but in terms of what their aspirations are and what they decide to do, that's that's something they will work out. We we won't, we don't get to say in that. What we can do at best is to set a very different example. But right now, if you think of the example that Canada sets to other countries, uh, we've got no credibility whatsoever to say that we've got to solve environmental problems and they've got to somehow have um, not, not aspired to what we want. So this is, a, if you like, it's a credibility building project as much as a, as a what we might call an environmentally, uh, environmental saving project. Thank you very much for that. Many of us have been waiting for that <laughs> for a long time. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how it, how we're going to get there politically. That's the, we can have all the solutions we want, but if we don't have the political will to do it, it ain't going to happen. I don't think I've ever given this kind of talk without that question coming up. <laughs> and, I mean, can I just say, <laughs> you ask a political scientist for that, for that so maybe they'll have the answer. But I will try and answer the question for you. Look, I think that the, 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 we can't expect there to be political will to support this kind of direction until there's been a lot more work done to show that this kind of, uh, of direction is plausible and is, is, is realistic in, in, in a broad sense of the term. So I don't think political will is going to sort of spring from nowhere until there's a much broader based discussion in our society as to alternatives. And that has to not just involve uh, academics like me who do the sort of the, the spade work to try to push these, this stuff out there. It requires all of us to, to talk up these ideas. Uh, in the end, the successful politicians generally lead from behind. They need to hear that discussion that's going on and then step forward and, and, and help us move in the direction that we want to go. But, you know, um, we've lived through remarkable political changes in the past. Uh, it's not that they don't happen. I guess just at any time you, you can't imagine how that, how that could be. So all I can say is that the role I've decided to play is to, is to devote my academic work to try to tell alternative stories and to try to tell them, by the way, in a way that um, maybe speaks to other economists. Sometimes I'm criticized for putting too much weight on GDP. I don't have much affection for GDP. I understand the statistic quite well. Um, but that's the way the discussion is conducted these days. It's about growth in GDP. So if you can't engage with that, you, you don't get an audience at all. So. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do, is to try to introduce these kinds of ideas, particularly the environmental dimension of, of economic growth, into the public discussion and the policy discussion about growth, and hopefully that, that, that it gets picked up in different ways. But if I had the magic answer, um, I would, uh, I'd be glad to share it with you, but I don't. Yes, I have a question related to my friend's question here, and that is, that it's, it's clear that um, politicians just about everywhere at all levels of government prattle on about growth as a solution to all our problems without recognizing that it's pretty well the cause of all our problems. And I'm just curious as to whether since you um, published Managing Without Design, if you've had any, any serious uh, inquiries, interest or, uh, from, from politicians. Uh, yes, I have. <laughs> um, mostly abroad. <laughs> so um, I've spoken in the European Parliament, in the UK House of Commons, the uh, committees there invited me over. Uh, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Minister of Finance in Finland, who's become Prime Minister there. Uh, so there's a, there's a, in some, in some quarters there's a curiosity, but I'll tell you where I find in Canada more interest is at the local level. It's, it's people at the local level, and then this, this applies to politicians too, municipal politicians, understand limits much more readily than politicians at a higher level. Because obviously if you work at the municipal level, you're up against limits all the time. You know your geography, you've got the waste management problem you have to deal with, and you deal with the other things that are directly related to the environment. Um, so that's, that's been my um, experience here. I have been invited to speak to a couple of political parties in, in Canada. And because I suppose my civil service background, they, they, they sometimes call me back to speak to the civil service. So, you know, that's, um, it's something, it's not enough. Yeah. At that point, I think we're going to have to cut the